All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar hosted by MedStar Montgomery Medical Center. My name is Tanya Paler, and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications, and I'm really looking forward to our program this evening in honor of American Heart Health Month. While this event looks a little different than in years past, tonight we will hear from two very impressive cardiologists here at MedStar Montgomery, Dr. Jean and Dr. Princewell. Tonight's discussion will address topics and questions around heart health, from prevention to treatment and recovery. So before we jump into our program tonight, I do have a few housekeeping items to mention. Throughout the event, please feel free to ask questions of either of the doctors with us tonight. To ask, simply use the Q&A button that you see at the bottom of my screen. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Additionally, our panelists cannot give individual medical advice here tonight. So if your question is better addressed directly with a physician, we will provide the appropriate contact information and ask you to reach out to schedule an appointment to speak with them. At this time, I'd like to thank our partner, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, AKA is the first sorority founded by African-American women and the Theta Omega Omega chapter has served the residents of Montgomery County for more than 50 years. We'll hear from them briefly a little later tonight as well. So thank you ladies for being here. All right, I'm very excited to introduce you to our wonderful guest host this evening, Jennifer Donnellan. She is an award-winning journalist, a heart health ambassador, and the public information officer for Prince George's County Fire and EMS. Thank you, Jennifer, for being here this evening. Thank you so much, Tanya. I am so excited about this evening. I have been looking forward to it all month. We know it's Heart Health Month and every year as a heart attack survivor, February is a very special time for me. I was 36 years old when I suffered a heart attack and um, I immediately took my story to the airwaves when I was a reporter on ABC7 News because it, I was in a hospital bed when I found out that heart disease was the number one killer of women. I found, found that out in the hospital. So um, that was a huge wake up call for me. And I just love events like this because it raises awareness. And I promise you, you're gonna walk away from this evening with something you may not have known and hopefully it will help you or someone you love. So we are on Zoom. I know that it's the end of a uh, Tuesday. And so I know that um, many of you have probably been on Zoom calls all day. So um, it's time to have fun. So relax, uh, get some coffee, get some red wine. It's heart healthy. And um, I hope that you enjoy this conversation with our panel of experts. I'm really, really looking forward to this. So I have to start with the really important stuff and that is bingo and trivia. Okay, so I need you to take notes as I speak and I'm actually gonna read directly. So I do not mess up any of these rules because this is really important stuff. So we have a lot of fun things planned for this evening. We are going to be testing your heart health knowledge with some trivia questions and bingo. Now you should have received a digital bingo card in the email. If you did not, you can, you can use a, a downloaded link. It's right there in your chat box. It just popped up. Um, it's within the Zoom chat. Download that link for the bingo game. Now you pick any one card from the selection throughout the discussion tonight. We will encourage everyone to be listening and looking for the keywords on your bingo card. If you're using the most recent version of Adobe Acrobat, you can click on the square as you hear each keyword or phrase mentioned and it will turn pink. Now, once you have five in a row, either across, down or horizontal, it will turn pink, uh, including the free space and you will have bingo. Now, if you yell out bingo, we won't hear you. This is what you need to do if you have bingo. We need you to send the word bingo to the chat box. The first three individuals to get bingo will earn a prize. And if you're not one of the first three to hit bingo, don't worry, please let us know in the chat box that you hit uh, five in a row because everyone who hits bingo will be entered into a raffle to win a prize. We also have other ways to score some fun prizes throughout this conversation tonight. We will be popping in with some heart health trivia. 
So we, again, are all here to have fun. These are serious topics. I love that you're here. I love that you're engaged on a weekday evening. And um, it already shows that, you know, knowledge is power and, and you are halfway there. So let's, let's get started. Let's meet our panelists. We have Dr. Estelle Jean. She's a cardiologist. She is a board certified cardiologist and board certified in echocardiogram. She's a member of MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute Women's Health Program. Dr. Jean treats a full spectrum of cardiac disorders with a primary focus on preventative interventions, women's cardiology, and pregnancy-related cardiovascular conditions. She also performs and interprets a variety of procedures, including TEE, echocardiogram, stress testing, cardioversion, vascular testing, and heart monitoring. And something that I'm really looking forward to hearing her speak about tonight is her role as the Montgomery County Cardiologist Representative in the MedStar COVID Recovery Program. Also joining us, Dr. Olashe Princewell. Dr. Princewell is a board certified cardiologist and MedStar Montgomery's Nuclear Medicine Technical Director. She treats a full spectrum of cardiac disorders with a primary focus on the prevention of cardiovascular diseases, women's health, and heart failure. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, doctors. We are going to be starting with Dr. Princewell. We're gonna talk about the topic of heart health and why it's so important and potentially life-saving for women in particular. Dr. Princewell. Hi, it's so good to see everybody today. We're so glad we're all here together, just being able to talk about not only being heart healthy, but just how COVID has impacted the heart and what we can do to stay healthy going forward. All right, you can go to the next slide. So as a lot of you know, February is American Heart Month and it was really created with the goal to raise awareness about heart disease. It's the number one killer of men and women in the US, but still a lot of people think of it as a man's illness or that it only affects people age 65 and older. For a lot of women, we get different symptoms suggesting that we might be having a heart attack or decreased blood to our heart. The typical symptoms are chest pain or feeling like you're clutching your chest, but there are a lot of people who have nausea, shortness of breath, indigestion, and some people get no symptoms at all. So in general, women are very intuitive. And so if you're not feeling well, it's always best to go get checked out with either your doctor or going to the emergency room. Thank you, Dr. Princewell. And I wanna talk about something that you know, I think a lot of people take for granted. They say, you know, my blood pressure, I know my blood pressure is okay, or I know my cholesterol may be a little bit up, but do you know all of your numbers? And, and really the high rates of impact that it has on women across all ages. As I mentioned at the beginning, I was 36 years old. I didn't even know what was going on when it, I had that sort of elephant sitting on my chest, crushing pain and my left arm went numb. If it hadn't been for the left arm going numb, I, I wouldn't even begun to think heart, heart attack. And even then I was like, no way. So how is it, what's, what is the cardiovascular risk factors that they need to be looking out for? Okay. So, you know, one of the number one risk factors is family history. I think it's very important for everyone to know you know, who in your family has been affected by heart disease, who's been affected by stroke, but there are also risk factors that you want to know if your family members have had high blood pressure, diabetes, diseases like this can really increase your risk of developing heart disease in life. Other symptoms or risk factors that I always tell my patients is, especially for women, what happens during pregnancy matters. So if you develop gestational diabetes or preeclampsia or high blood pressure, these are risk factors for developing heart disease later. And so it's really important to stay on top of this. All right, thank you, Dr. Principal. Okay, as we mentioned at the top of the show, we're also going to be doing some trivia in addition to our bingo. I hope that you're listening and marking down those um, those words and phrases as, as our doctors are delivering their presentations. Um, let's start with the first trivia question. Um, let's test everyone's heart health knowledge about um, risk factors. And actually, Dr. Jean, I'm gonna have you answer this. There are risk factors you can control to lower your risk of heart disease 
true or false? And we're going to give people a chance to answer. So this is a true or false. There are risk factors that you can control to lower your risk of heart disease. Is that true or is that false? Doctors, we can't vote, so. <laughs> Don't be here anyway, so you know the answers. <laughs> All right, Dr. Dr. Jean, is that true or false? Yes, that is true. Actually, 73% of heart attacks that occur in patients aged 35 to 44 have been attributed to unhealthy lifestyle. And there's lots of things that we put in that category. So that includes maintaining a healthy weight, um, making sure that you're staying active and um, exercising regularly, eating a heart healthy diet. And other things that you want to do is definitely not smoke because smoking is an important risk factor that we can control. And the longer that patients smoke, the more that they're at risk for having a heart event. And of course, you do want to limit your um, alcohol intake. And other things I talk with my patients are the S's. So one major S, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but is stress, right? So we've all have been under a lot of stress during this past year and all the changes that's happened to our lives, but the stress levels that we're experiencing can cause inflammation and cause our um, increased service for having heart disease. And the other important S is sleep. So making sure that you're having a good amount of sleep um, because sleep is really the crux of many diseases when there's lack of it or poor quality that definitely increases the risk um, of having um, heart disease. Great, thank you, Dr. Jean. The, all of great information that I know that we can all take to heart, especially now more than ever. And we're not moving as much, we're in front of these computers all day long. Uh, Dr. Principal, let's talk more about this. What are some of the unhealthy choices that put us at greater risk for heart disease and what are some of the practical ways for us to help lower that risk? Okay, so Dr. Jean touched on this a little bit, but some of the things that we shouldn't do is smoke. You know, for a lot of people, smoking cigarettes was something that was very common. And what we didn't realize early on was that it contains a lot of tobacco and nicotine that can really cause plaque buildup in the arteries of our heart. So if you smoke, that would be very important for you to quit smoking at this time. Another thing is alcohol. I had a patient recently who came in to see me because she developed heart failure because she drank a lot of alcohol. And so I think for a lot of us, especially with all the stress that's been going on, you know, we wanna drink a glass of wine to settle down and then a glass of wine becomes two, maybe three. So it's really important to try to stick to no more than one drink a night for women or two drinks a night for men. Now, your weight. Another thing that has been trending upwards during COVID-19 is a lot of people's weight. And that's because we're not moving as much as we usually do. We're not going to the grocery store as much. We're not seeing friends and family. And you know we're eating more. We're watching television, snacking. And for most of us, we're choosing to not get on the scale and say, oh, it's okay. You know, I have nowhere to go. But it's really important to keep track of your weight because obesity is one of the number one risk factors for developing heart disease. And so although it may be scary, the first step is getting on the scale and knowing where you're at. And so that might be motivation enough to get us moving more. And blood pressure. I think, you know, almost 70% of people over the age of 60 in the United States have hypertension. For a lot of people, it's not diagnosed. And so buying a blood pressure cuff or machine from places like the CVS or even online at Amazon and just having it in your house and keeping an eye on your blood pressure. Gold blood pressures are less than 140 over 90 for most people, but it's important to talk to your primary care doctor or your cardiologist about your specific goal. And you know, uh, a lot of people ask me about my heart attack and what I had going on before my heart attack. And, and the day I had the heart attack, I had a spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which is very common among women. Um, <laughs> I learned all of this after I had it. Um, I think 80% of the victims are female, postpartum, depression, stress, lifting heavy weights, that sort of thing. Um, and it, just to sort of do a reality check here, I, I know we all 
know this, right? We should exercise, we shouldn't smoke, we shouldn't drink. It's, 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 not, ne- it's not easy and it's certainly not easy now. <laughs> uh, it's harder than ever. Um, but as the doctors are explaining, this can save our lives. The fact that we can prevent turnaround heart disease, um, the, this is the information that could save your life. So um, time for trivia, yay. Um, this one has a little bit of math to it. Didn't, didn't score well in math. That's why I became a television news reporter and not a doctor. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's, let's look at this trivia question. 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week is recommended to reduce your risk of heart disease. True or false? 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week is recommended to reduce your risk of heart disease. We'll give the, our, um, our viewing audience a, a chance to answer that. And Dr. Prince, Will, I am going to have you answer the question. True, right. I would so say yes. This is absolutely <laughs> true. You know, ideally we should all begin at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise at least five days a week. This can be brisk walking, running, cycling, Zumba. You know, when it gets warmer outside, you can get outside to jump rope or play tennis. Any kind of heart pumping aerobic exercise is the kind that we have in mind when we say we should get at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. Resistance training is also really important. I tell a lot of my patients, you know, lifting light weights or doing jumping jacks or sit-ups and push-ups can really help strengthen our muscles, which is great exercise. And so I think for all of us, we could all try and exercise a little bit more while we're sitting in the house. <laughs> and Dr. Olisha, you started moving around when you were answering that question about, pers- I know I started wanting to stretch <laughs> and um, good, good. It's addictive. I love it. Let's all and get way moving. Your calories. <laughs> exactly. Just sway sides. I bet you everybody at home right now is swaying awesome. side to side. I know. Stretch your arms. Anything. That's right. Let's go. <laughs> We can do this. <laughs> I said, I don't, you're never too young to chair exercise, okay? No, um, no, not too young. No, true, true story. Mm-hmm. All right, so um, my next question, thank you, Dr. Prince. Well, my next question is for Dr. Jean. And I think that this is a question that's at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, whether you you are suffering from heart disease knowingly or whether you, you, you um, don't have heart disease, um, but it's the question of COVID. Um, and it's the impact of COVID um, and, and what it means for us, both long and short term. So um, Dr. Jean, can you talk about sort of the intersection of the pandemic and cardiovascular health? Yes. So, you know, obviously we have been dealing with COVID for this past year and we've learned a lot. Early on, unfortunately, one of the things that we were learning was that patients were choosing to stay home. And so they were having worse outcomes. Um, You know, we were seeing patients much later in the stage of treatable heart attacks that if they were coming in very early, we could fix the problem. You know, I have one patient that I unfortunately took care of where he waited so long early on during a pandemic that he ended up on a heart transplant because his heart got really damaged. But thankfully, as there was ongoing awareness, especially through MedStar, through various campaigns, um, a lot more patients have started becoming more comfortable seeking care. But it's we can't sort of not emphasize that enough, how important it is to make sure that you stay in contact with your providers. But specifically things that we are learning during this pandemic in terms of COVID with the heart, you know, it can cause inflammation of the heart and cause this condition called myocarditis. It can cause inflammation in the outer lining of the heart, um, which we call pericarditis and can cause um, chest pain in patients, but also just the excess stress that patients are experiencing. As we talked about the physical inactivity, um, you know, the weight gain and the stress can cause the class type of heart attacks that patients are getting. Um, And then lastly, for women in particular, the stress. So you talked about one unique type of heart attacks that we see, um, we know women experience, which is the spontaneous coronary artery dissection that you um, experience. And so that in particular is a tear in the lining of the artery, but also women can get a um, stress-induced, stress-induced weakening of the heart muscle that we call 
stress-induced cardiomyopathy or takasubo is the other term where the heart literally just stops pumping and stops working well because of the enormous amount of stress. So there is a full spectrum of illnesses that can occur. And so that's why we really want to emphasize doing this webinar that you continue to stay in contact with your healthcare providers and don't stay home because you're afraid of getting COVID in a, in a facility. Yeah, and you know, um, you talked about, you know, the the hesitancy to come to the hospital. Um, you know, I, I was a news reporter for 20 years, and then I've crossed over, and and now I I'm the director of public information for the Prince George's County Fire and EMS Department, and and we in Prince George's County on the first responder side, you know, our crews are are going out to the homes and getting the sick people and bringing them to the hospital, we've seen a decrease in our call volume over the last year. And, and we've attributed it to COVID that people are afraid to go to the hospital. But what we also have seen is um, a, a marked increase in cardiac arrest calls, like the severity of the calls have just gotten worse. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a marked increase in the number of what we call priority four calls, which are um, for people who have sadly already passed away. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting at home and, and you just get scared because, you know, people are scared and you like you got to get to the hospital. So, um, you know, there, there are studies that are out. CDC has studied it. Um, they've shown a decline in um, emergency room visits mm -hmm. for these types of calls. What are you seeing at MedStar Montgomery and then Really quick, what would you say to a patient who is at home, not feeling well, and is scared to go to the hospital? Yeah, so we it's gone through phases. Early on, the ER visits had decreased by as much as 40 to 50 percent, and that included for strokes, heart attacks, congestive heart failure. I mean, it was really concerning early on. Thankfully, you know, as we learned more and patients started re-engaging with the healthcare system through telehealth visits and various other means of communication, they have started to come back. And um, so we're really grateful for that. But, you know, I still get conversations. I still get phone calls from my patients who are having chest pain, who are feeling short of breath, and they're refusing to go to the emergency room. So, you know, as this will continue to probably go on for the next year, we cannot allow such a huge gap in care. Um, you know, this pandemic has devastated the lives of so many family members and friends. And, um, but at the same time though, heart disease is the number one cause of death. And so we have to remember that we need to stay connected with our um, providers, making sure our risk factors are well treated, the blood pressure, diabetes, because these conditions put strain on the heart, which makes it harder to fight off um, COVID. And um, so that's really sort of the main takeaway now is to continue to engage with our patients, to bring them in, come to the office or do a telehealth visit, but we can't let that gap in communication or gap in care continue for the next year. Yes, it's, it's just as dangerous, if not more, than contracting COVID is waiting too long on these yeah, issues. Yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, and we've talked about. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to keep going. I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm like no, sitting no. at the edge of my feet. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, exactly as you stated, you know, these calls are really concerning. I mean, we're seeing patients, I've had several patients come in with congestive heart failure and heart rhythm issues that really occurred and got to a later stage because they waited a little bit too long, well, much too long um, to seek medical care. And so at MedStar in particular, they have taken the proper precautions. So be it testing or um, elective procedures. So for example, before patients can get any sort of elective procedures, they have to have their COVID um, status known. So they're getting a rapid COVID test the day of the procedure to make sure that it's safe and that we continue to provide care and not allow such a huge gap in care um, as we're battling with this pandemic. And one last question, I'm gonna go off script just a little bit. I'm curious, have you seen an increase in the number being that we've seen an increase in cardiac arrest calls. Are you seeing that in your practice? Are you seeing more cardiac patients? Are you seeing more patients? Now? I'm seeing more patients and I'm seeing sort of the full spectrum. Um, a lot of palpitations, um, a lot of high blood pressure and some atypical chest pain just from the stress, just the enormity of the stress. But yes, I am seeing blood pressures, heart disease that's not well controlled because I have had patients who literally have not had contact since 2019. Um, and so then I'm having to do a lot more to treat their congestive heart failure and heart disease because they're just coming in much sicker. 
And that's what the data is showing that patients are coming in sicker. Yep, I understand. Okay, so uh, trivia question on that on that upbeat note, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, true or false? I don't have any symptoms, therefore I must not have cardio a cardiovascular issue. Da -na 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 -na. All right, staying with Dr. Jean. Survey says. All right, my. Everyone says it's false. It's false. Actually, 64% um, of women who um, die suddenly of coronary heart disease had no previous symptoms. So as we talk about, you know, classically, we think of sort of the elephant sitting on my chest, but the symptoms for women can be different. So it can be decreased stamina, shortness of breath, sweating, or left arm discomfort. Some patients even have indigestion or fatigue, um, certain heart conditions can present as a fainting spell. And so we have to stay alert. You have to be very mindful of the symptoms that you're having. Let us do the work and figure it out for you. And please don't feel bad. You know, if there's, there's just this thing amongst us as women, we always feel guilty for contacting our providers and we have to get rid of that. Um, you know, part of this is to empower you if you don't feel well, call your provider. And if they're not willing to take you seriously, then look for someone else. But we have to continue to advocate for um, ourselves as women providers and to make sure that we seek people who will listen. Yep. And uh, word to the wise, tell your doctor everything. I mean, every time I go to the doctor, I feel like I'm going to confession. But uh, my doctor can't do and, and take care of me unless I tell them the truth right? How, how, whether I'm exercising or not, what am I eating? What am I drinking? I mean, they need to know the truth so that they can uh, treat me and take care of me. So be your own advocate and tell the truth. Yes. All right. Tell the truth. Um, we know anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know you all know too. <laughs> I love my cardiologist. Um, let's talk about COVID-19 vaccines. Hot, hot topic. Yeah. Um, a lot of concern out there. Uh, a lot of like, you know, ground root, grassroot efforts to educate people to um, alleviate fears. So can we talk about the COVID-19 vaccines that are being rolled out right now? I know that there are two approved, two approved vaccines. Um, there's um, optimism about some additional ones being approved soon. So can you talk about the ones that are currently available? And what do you know about the other ones that we may see up for emergency authorization? So in terms of the ones that are available, the two main ones are Pfizer and Moderna. Um, currently we're using more Moderna likely due to just the differences in its storage. It's easier to store than the Pfizer that requires a much colder, colder temperature. But they're both used, they both use the newer technology called messenger RNA, which has sort of the coding information within it. It goes into the cell and it then allows this, your body to make this thing called a spike protein. So the spike protein is just this very little part of the virus that when your body makes it, it now sees this foreign agent, then our antibodies are created so that the next time if you were to get COVID, you already have the antibodies present to make sure that um, you can fight it. And so what's been really great about these studies, is they're very effective. Um, Moderna was 94% effective and Pfizer 95% effective at preventing severe illnesses and death, which is, you know, a tremendous stride in just medicine and how it's advanced. And, you know, sometimes I get a, a lot of concerns from patients that they feel that it was rushed or it happened too quickly, but I do remind them that, you know, there was a lot of research actually published about messenger RNA um, vaccines years before this. Um, and so when this new um, pandemic became about, they just used prior research data that was available and then partnered with, um, you know, Moderna, for example, um, to create this vaccine. And of course, this is, you know, all hands were on deck, you know, the scientific community worked very closely, there was a lot of money and funding that was created to ensure that we would be able to get it in an expedited way to save lives. Um, and so some other things that I definitely talk with my patients is that it does not impact their DNA because it doesn't go inside the inner um, portion of the cell that we call the nucleus, because there's been some misinformation about it damaging people's DNA, and it does not. It actually gets broken down within 24 hours of being in the cell. And the other thing is there's, for women in particular, there is no data to suggest that it 
impacts fertility. So there are no fertility um, impact with either of the vaccines. Okay. And, you know, I, I, I've always, because everybody says, well, they made it so quick. Well, you know, for the first time, I'm like, oh, so we, we just saw what can happen, okay. you know, when, when you remove all the barriers, when countries work together and um, people share data with one another, look what happens and look what we can pull off. I think that it's, it's um, actually makes me very hopeful about the future and a lot of other diseases, if we could just all work to get along. Um, let's talk about the, <laughs> let's talk about the, um, the effects. So I, I have had my um, my vaccine. I had the Moderna shot. I had my second shot, um, and I do know that I had I had some pretty serious um, effects from it. Um, hold on, everybody, because you know what? This is live TV. It's live Zoom, and I'm this is spam. I I, I don't even know my home phone number. It's spam. Um, I, I was really sick by day two, um, but I'm 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 much better now. And at the end of the day. I, I felt really bad for people who've had COVID because I was like, gosh, I'm this sick. And I know it doesn't introduce COVID into your, into your body, but I just feeling that bad for that one day, um, I, I just felt lucky, you know, because I'm like, you know, I'm having a rough day today, but I also have this added huge relief of this extra layer of protection. What are some of the side effects? So the, the common side effects are you can get fever, you can get muscle aches. Um, some patients experience headache. I personally also experienced the insomnia, just the um, and fatigue, and feel um, tired afterwards. And um, but as you stated, normally lasts anywhere from um, 24 to 48 hours. What's been interesting, what we've learned thus far, it seems like older patients tend to have a little bit less symptoms compared to younger patients in terms of just how the body is adjusting to. Um, the vaccine, um, but they are usually just self-limiting and you can treat with, you know, various remedies to help overcome those symptoms. But after 14 days of getting your second shot, the Moderna shot, um, you are effective. So you get to that 94, 95% effectiveness um, two weeks after the second dose. Yeah. And, you know, while as relieved as I am, you know, <laughs> the mask stays on, you know, it's, again, it just, yeah. I think you had said it earlier, it, it, you, it's the, if you do get COVID after you've had the shot, it's less severe, you're lowering your potential for a fatal outcome, right? Exactly, exactly. So the, the jury's still out. We don't really know um, whether or not you can still transmit the virus if you end up getting mm. it. And so, um, you know, typically with like the flu vaccine or shingle vaccine, um, their job is to make sure that you don't get severe illness. And so we have to treat it sort of in that premise that there is the possibility that you may get it, but just be an asymptomatic carrier, which is good, right? You're not getting a severe illness, but during that time period, you're unaware and you may still spread it. So that's the importance of continuing to wear your mask, socially distance and washing your hands um, to make sure that we continue to keep the numbers low. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Jean. Can you talk about your role in MedStar Health COVID Recovery Program? Yes. So early on last year, you know, um, MedStar started to analyze many of the patients who had COVID. So, you know, six weeks post, patients were just having symptoms that's described as the long hauler, the long COVID, yeah. the ongoing fatigue, um, you know, headache, shortness of breath, um, chest pain, and um, fogginess of their brain and just really not feeling like they're back to their normal self. And with this being a new disease, and sometimes patients can feel lost within a medical system and having to contact various providers with different specialties, MedStar decided to do a multidisciplinary collaboration across um, the entire system. So we have um, people from the National Rehab um, Hospital. Um, so we have the physical medicine and rehabilitation patients that um, group that will focus on the fatigue and the muscle aches. We have neurologists involved. We have um, is psychiatrists involved for the ongoing anxiety and the um, sort of depression that's associated with it, lung specialists, the pulmonologists, cardiologists, gastroenterologists, because for many patients mm -hmm. post-COVID, they continue to have nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. So this COVID recovery program aims to target patients who with ongoing symptoms across multiple sort of 
body system six weeks post and they have not recovered. So by connecting with that program, we're going to work together as a team to make sure that patients are followed very closely and have providers who are keeping up to, um, up to date with the various COVID research to help with their recovery. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's and that's knowledge. Again, you know, you're gathering all of that that knowledge. Yes, you just, you, and they're publishing the data um, thus far, and um, and so it is an important you um, and it's an important program that's available to everyone attending. So if you know any loved ones who may be having ongoing symptoms, to reach out to the program so we can get connected and learn more. Yeah, because and you know what I love that you mentioned was the mental health piece. Mm -hmm. So I've talked a lot about this um, in the ten years since I had my heart attack. Um, I was not prepared for the mental health piece um, after I had the heart attack. No one warned me when I went home that I was going to be afraid to sleep, afraid to be alone, um, that I was going to live in fear of dying for, you know, every waking moment there. I suffered PTSD, um, especially in, in communities of color. Um, we don't talk about mental health as much as we should be talking about mental health. And I know mental health is really on the forefront right now, especially with COVID and people being inside and isolated for so long. Um, what, what resources does MedStar Montgomery offer to its patients for, for that piece? For the mental health aspect, I mean, we do have a psychiatry program that's available. And so as long as they're, you know, connected within sort of that recovery program, that gives them sort of um, additional earlier access to many of the providers, because that's part of our commitment when we sign up for it is to create the space, create the time to see the patients in a timely manner. Okay, great. All right, so we are, um, we are actually going to move now to Q&A. And I have seen a lot of questions coming up as we've been going along here. Um, one of the questions we're gonna start off with, and Dr. Jean, Dr. Princewell, I'll, uh, I'll let you answer this. Uh, this. This came in from a person who said, I tested positive last fall for COVID-19 and I've heard a lot about the long-term effects on your heart and lungs. When do you suggest that I see my cardiologist and do you re recommend further testing? So um, when should they be seeing you? So I think if they got tested or were tested positive a few months ago, this is a good time to come and see your cardiologist and the other specialists, depending on which specialist you're seeing, then they'll recommend different testing. I know for a lot of my patients who've had COVID who are having some symptoms such as chest pain or palpitations, we're really taking advantage of doing echocardiograms or ultrasounds of the heart to make sure structurally your heart looks good and there's no evidence of fluid around your heart, which can be common for people who have either myocarditis or other complications secondary to COVID-19. I'm also doing a lot of monitors because arrhythmias were a big concern early on that COVID could lead the arrhythmias down the line. And so we're really trying to do testing like that and stress tests. I think for a lot of cardiologists, we've seen that COVID has unmasked heart disease. People had it, but due to the stress of fighting COVID, you know, now it's become more evident that they do have blockages in the arteries of your heart. And so now is as good a time as any to really follow up with your cardiologist. Okay, thank you. Um, so I know you, uh, we have a question here. I'm looking at the questions. I'm, um, the, uh, we got a question from O. Brown Lee asking if it's the same for um, e-cigarettes in terms of effects on the heart as smoking. So, what we know so far is it's not, usually it doesn't contain as much of the byproducts that you see in tobacco or typical um, cigarettes. But because it does contain nicotine and other things, we told a lot of people it's still not safe long-term. And so there was a point where people were consistently being told to use vaping or e-cigarettes to replace um, the traditional cigarettes. But for me personally, I do not recommend it to patients. I think there are other options such as Chantix or nicotine patches and other things that we can try to help get you off smoking traditional cigarettes as opposed to the e-cigarettes. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Jean, does prolonged grief of losing a loved one affect your heart in a ne negative way? I know you were, there was talk about the broken heart syndrome earlier on when we started. 
Yes, exactly. You know, there's a study that suggests stress can cause 90%, can cause up to 90% of diseases. And that's from just the chronic inflammation that your body is seeing. And so unfortunately, the grieving process, it's one of, one of the most stressful time for many patients. And so we can see this in high, it can elevate your blood pressure, it can raise your blood sugar, um, impact your sleep pattern. And we know sleep as well is so important for your cardiovascular health. And so doing that time period, in addition to staying in contact with a grief counselor and your provider in terms of maybe getting some medication if you're really struggling, um, you know, it, you really do need to stay in close contact to make sure that you're not developing any adverse um, cardiovascular diseases and events. Okay. Um, uh, we have a question about, it, it's, it's short um, and not in context, so I'm just going to assume there must be some latest research out there, but it's latest research about baby aspirin with a question mark. Is there some bad news out there or? So I wouldn't say still... bad news. I think in general, <laughs> there was a time when we recommended to everybody that everyone should take a baby aspirin over the age of 50 because it could prevent heart attacks or strokes down the line. But what we found more recently is that we have a lot of drugs that can really control the risk factors, such as antihypertensive medications or statins for high cholesterol or diabetes medications. And so if we're able to control the risk factors, taking a baby aspirin on top of that for people who do not have heart disease or do not have a history of stroke may not be beneficial and can actually be harmful. On a population level, we're finding that more patients are likely to experience bleeding in their gut than they are to reduce their risk of having a heart attack and stroke. And so it's always a personal decision that you should make with your providers, whether it's your primary care physician or your cardiologist. But at this time, I don't recommend baby aspirin as primary prevention, meaning for people who've never had a history of heart attack, strokes, or heart surgeries. Okay, thank you. Um... We mentioned at the top, I think I did, <laughs> um, that uh, a little bit of red wine can be heart healthy. Um, we've been asked, is marijuana heart healthy or is it detrimental? No, marijuana is not heart healthy. And actually there's some reports. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's some donuts? <laughs> no, it's not. But um, you know, there's some published studies that they found in patients admitted with heart attacks having higher um, you know, incidence of having marijuana in their bloodstream. So potentially, you know, maybe with what, if it's mixed with other substances when they're having their marijuana, but generally speaking, no, it's not heart healthy. Even though I know some patients take it because it helps them to relax, but we generally don't recommend it. Okay. Um, are there, um, Dr. Jean, are there any major differences beyond the 94% versus 95% efficacy rate uh, Moderna? versus Pfizer. We're, we've been asked uh, a couple of times about that. Major no, thankfully no. Here. No major differences. No. No okay. major differences. Anything? We got a lot of questions too about the future vaccines. Any yeah. inside scoop? Yeah. So AstraZeneca, um, it still hasn't received approval yet. It's not as effective um, compared to Moderna and Pfizer. And Johnson & Johnson, that one is a little confusing, truthfully, to um, sort of go over the data because there's lots of different numbers. So there's the higher numbers in the 80% range, but that's when you can do it within the first 28 days. But then post 28 days, that's where it gets lower at 66%. And then there's different numbers um, related to how effective it is with the various strains, which we've heard in terms of the South Africa um, strain, it's less effective. And so we need more information, but right now, because the Moderna and the Pfizer are so effective, it is still probably what we'll be using. But of course, we will probably will need the other ones to help with the demand that we currently have. I mean, I'm constantly getting phone calls and emails from my patients wanting to get the vaccine and they just don't have it yet. So we have to fill the demand somehow. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a big, that's a big, um hurdle they need to cross. And then also um, in parts of the world, you know, realistically, um, you know, the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson, they're just easier to distribute because they don't have the temperature requirements. So they're going to be something that's used as well um, to help vaccinate people globally. Okay. Um, do you think they look at something like a booster? I mean, I think that these variants, it's, it was such like, oh, know. you know, we're finally got the, the, the vaccine here. We're just starting to get it out. And now we've got these variants that 
you know, it's just the hits keep coming. I know it does. We're, all we can hope at some point we're going to, the COVID will mutate into a less le dangerous um, form, but they are working, Moderna is working and looking at in terms of a booster. So we may end up needing a booster. It's like yearly um, with the flu shot, we have to get right. it. So that might right. be sort of our new normal for a while. Which means we need to get everybody the first shot. Yeah. Um, we've got questions coming in about heart health that I don't want to miss. Um, hold on, let me just back up a little bit. Um, what is a type two heart attack? I'm going to kind of do these like a round robin so we can try and get some of these answered. Sorry. What's a type two heart attack? I'm not sorry. Sure. So I think you're talking about, that's a little bit more technical. So right. that's when patients are in a hospital, they're really sick. So just like when someone's really, really sick, they can have failure, um, you know, their bone marrow can get suppressed. And so we'll see lower blood counts. And so the heart's one of the many organs as well. So when we do check the heart test, the enzymes, we'll see that there is some leakage in the circulation, but we don't consider it like a acute plaque, like acute heart attack, where we have to fix it, fix the blockage. In those cases, we have to fix what the illness is. So many times patients with severe COVID with heart disease, that additional strain in the heart makes it harder for the heart to fight. So when we check the blood test, they'll have the type two. So we fix COVID, not fix the arteries. I mean, we treat them in terms of their COVID. Okay. okay. How can you tell if you're straining your heart or pushing yourself too hard when trying to challenge yourself during exercise? So I don't think there's a uh, pushing yourself too hard per se. I think when we're out of- I'd be like, my doctor told me I can't push myself this too hard. <laughs> Go ahead, I, I'm sorry, serious oh, question. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where if we're out of shape, if we're deconditioned, it's always good to start slowly. That means walking or doing light exercises, to kind of get your body back into shape. The heart is a muscle, just like the muscles in your body. So it's really important to build that back up as opposed to going straight to running a marathon. And so I don't think there's a way for you to push yourself too hard. You just keep exercising until you feel like you're tired, then you rest or take a drink of water. But there's no limit if you keep pushing yourself. Okay, well, that just took all my excuses off the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you get into the recovery program? What's the contact info for the cover, COVID recovery program? Can they go to your website? Um, well, can we put the link in the chat? It's the MedStar recovery. Um, we should be able to put it within a link, the chat, so that you guys can access it. Smithsarhop.org, I think, slash. Yeah, we'll get that done. Do you know how long? I'm sorry, and I we got how long will the vaccines be effective once you've had them? We don't know, right? No, we don't know that quite yet. Yeah. Um, you know, generally speaking, in vaccine studies, patients are monitored for about two months. So yeah. we are collecting more information to see how long the immunity lasts for. We don't okay. quite. So that's again another important reason why we got to continue the follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, I've got a question. Should I get an allergy test or what question should I ask my doctor about my personal sensitivities for either vaccination? So I know that when you, when you, when you sign up, you register, it does ask you, have you ever had an allergic reaction to a vax, uh, like a flu vaccination before, right? Have you ever had gone into anaphylactic shock? Uh, this person, should they do anything? Should they get an allergy test to make sure that they're okay? Or would they know by now? I mean, I would defer that with, you know, that person should talk awesome. to the primary to see and kind of go over. And so last month, Moderna actually updated their data. Um, after four, over 4 million individuals vaccinated, the incidence of true anaphylaxis that needed treatment was only 10 patients. So it's, you know, it was widely reported early on, but it doesn't be really clinically that frequent of an event. So, um, but of course, everyone's in different. And so that's a personal individual decision to discuss with your provider and or your allergist. For more okay, cool. If you've, if you've had COVID, how long do you need to wait to get the vaccine? So I believe you're, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. There have been kind of mixed results from different people. My understanding is immunity if you've had COVID is from three months up to nine months. It varies widely. And so usually what I would say is just sign up and see when you're eligible and then get the vaccine when possible. 
Right. And don't and keep wearing your mask and keep washing your hands and keep socially distancing and do all of that. Like it's not, you know, I've, I've talked to people who are like, I can't wait to get the vaccine. As soon as I get the vaccine, I'm like, no, 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 no. As soon as you get the vaccine, you're going to keep doing what you've been doing. Just, you exactly. just sleep now, I mean, for experience thus far, patients who, and this has been published, patients who have had COVID and then get the vaccine, they do have a little bit more um, reaction with the vaccines or something for you to just be aware of, but it's self-limited and treatable, but you may experience a little bit more of the side effects compared to if you've never had the vaccine. I mean, you've never had COVID infection. Yes. Um, do you, if you're over the age of 75, can the vaccines um, available now protect you at what rate? So I mean, for our, our, older, our older population. The older population. So yes, they didn't comprise the very old, um, much older population wasn't a huge um, proportion of the original clinical trials, but we're of course collecting more information, but we are treating it with the same efficacy range and expecting it to be 94, 95% effective. Okay. Um, I think we, we've got a, uh, oh, I, I love this question. They're asking about the mental health. Um, is there a hotline? number? Is there a way for people to reach out? There are resources out there. Maybe Tanya can put that information. The direct yeah. platform for Montgomery Medical Center, yes, maybe we can put it in the, um, the chat section. Okay. Um, before we wrap up, and um, I, just, I just was wondering if you all had any, I know we've covered a lot of ground here, but do you have anything that you would like to, to sort of make sure that you're getting across to those who have joined us tonight? I think for me, the biggest thing is do not delay care. If you feel as if you're having any kind of symptoms or your blood pressure is out of whack, please, please, please contact your primary care provider or your cardiologist or any specialist so we can check you out. I know a lot of people have been really concerned about coming into the emergency room, but coming into people's offices have been safe making sure that we really control your risk factors so that you don't develop a heart disease or stroke. And if you do have symptoms of a heart disease and stroke, we intervene as soon as possible to decrease the risk of bad outcomes. And I can't stress that enough. Get checked out when you don't feel right. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and just to piggyback on that, um, again, CDC guidelines, very effective at helping to reduce transmission. But as we talked about, um, one of the really, an important way to reduce your personal risk of getting severe COVID is to make sure that your personal risk factors are treated. So if you smoke, please stop. Um, you know, getting back into the routine of exercising, managing your stress, making sure that you're sleeping, eating a heart healthy diet, because um, these important interventions really will make your immune system healthier and, um, and make sure, well, at least hopefully help to reduce your risk of getting severe illness. And um, back to not allowing gap in care. So for many patients, they do need and require medications to treat their blood pressure, to treat their diabetes. So make sure that you don't run out of your prescriptions and to make and to refill them so that these risk factors are well controlled with both lifestyle and medications. I love, uh, I love that we just had a, a, a panelist, I'm gonna to toss things back over to Tanya, but who just said, I'm sorry, an attendee who said, thank you, making appointment tomorrow. <laughs> Great. Way to we go. Love to it. <laughs> we love that, Tanya. And I um actually I sorry one last thing I did put the um the link for the um MedStar Recovery Program in the chat for you guys to be able to access. But it's MedStarHealth.org slash covered um COVID recovery. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, panelists and um and Jennifer. Well, with that, um, we're gonna bring our evening to a close here, but we do have a few uh, thank yous and a few other things that we wanna mention before we close out. Um, at this time, what I would like to do is invite Michelle Gill, who's the president of Theta Omega Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority here in Montgomery County to share just a few words with us. So if you could unmute Michelle, please. We'll bring her to the floor now. Okay, thank you, Tanya. It's so nice to be here with everyone this evening. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Theta Omega Omega Chapter was chartered in Montgomery County, Maryland on November 22nd, 1969. And our, 
our members, we have been working hard for the residents of Montgomery County, even through this uh, current environment that we're, we're in. Um, our guiding principle is service to all mankind and Theta Omega Omega has driven to implement this principle through the programs outlined at our national level, as well as programs and activities that specifically meet the needs of Montgomery County residents. The chapter's history is rich and noteworthy. However, there's still more work to be done in the community that the chapter membership supports through programmatic initiatives and activities. Why are we here this evening? Well, one of our areas that we focus on is women's health care and wellness, and heart health is one of the primary areas that we focus on. Um, we, under our heart health or our women's wellness target, we focus on being active, we walk, and we've been walking virtually together, and we've also been educating ourselves in the public, and that's why we are so happy to have this opportunity to partner with MedStar Montgomery this evening. We appreciate the opportunity to, uh, again, partner again this year, and thank you so much for inviting us. All right. Thanks so much, Michelle. And thank you to all of the members of Theta Omega Omega who joined us um, this evening. Of course, I want to thank again our wonderful moderator, Jennifer, for hosting us during this um, interesting and, and fun activity. And thank you to our brilliant panelists for sharing with us such important information um, to help us champion our, our own personal health. So um, just like a few reminders, if you have questions following the event, please visit medstarhealth.org or you can call Dr. Princewell or Dr. Jean's office at 301-570-7404. At the conclusion of tonight's event, you'll be prompted to participate in a very short survey about the presentation tonight. I hope you'll take a few minutes to give us your feedback so we can continue to bring you interesting and fun events in the future. So finally, on behalf of myself and MedStar Montgomery Medical Center, thank you for spending your evening with us. Stay safe and stay healthy. Good night.